Good morning, fellas, and welcome morning. again to the Bible study and the Gospel of John. This morning, like we do periodically, one of our Moot Men members uh, shares a story, and Bill has agreed this morning. So, um, long, long standing member, <laughs> like the rest of you. <laughs> but, uh, Bill, take it away. Tell us your story, and hopefully, some of it is true. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. I mean, I, I was I was born in 1949, so I'm of that generation, and um, my uh, uh, let me let my dog out. You let the dog out. <laughs> She's gone. Okay. And um, I grew up in a Presbyterian church. Um, I used to say nominally Christian family. On re retrospect, I. I don't use that anymore. They were Christian. They were, dad was a World War II vet, and they were that generation. Um, in respect of the church, went, but you know, didn't you know? It wasn't the Billy Graham type of an environment. Let's put it that way. And uh, when I got to college, I was in college for a couple reasons. I liked an education, but I didn't want to go into the service. You know, the Vietnam was hovering over us, and nobody was really excited about. You know, once once the news came back about how tough it could be we we're all just glad to be in college and by the time I graduated I had a high draft number so that just sort of passed over me like a cloud uh, and I I was always I wasn't an only child I had one older brother who later had mental health issues which formed a lot of who I am uh, I'll tell you later on that but I was pretty kind of lonely I was always a lonely kid I took part in athletics I had friends but um I moved to Colorado with one friend. We said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I don't want to live in Minot. And so we went to Colorado and I found a job right away with the utility. Never realizing that I won the lottery ticket only in retrospect. And so I started working. I had a degree in mathematics. And after about five years, I still felt pretty lost. And so I, I went on a vision, tri a vision trip. I took my van and took off. I extended vacation, and I, I had one of these Ford panel vans, you know, with a bed in the back and a heater, and I used it for skiing. But I took it out the West Coast. Went to visit a family that used to live down the street from us in Minot. They moved when I, my one friend was a junior, a big Irish Catholic family. Wonderful people, wonderful people. And I liked all of them. Kevin was my friend. His brother Jim was my friend. His younger sister Debbie was my friend. And while I was there, I was going to head up the coast, and I knew Debbie had moved to um, Oregon. And they said, oh, you got to go see Debbie. She would love to see you. She had just had a baby as a single mother. You know, she had the boyfriend broke up with, but she would love to have a little, you know, um, something, you know, someone to help her out for a week or two. But you got to be aware, Dale, she's, uh, she's become a Christian, you know. <laughs> and I said, oh, dear, you know, so... I went up there and I thought I'd find a woman who was kind of lost and at loose ends and everything. And her life was chaotic, but she was just absolutely a, a shining light in that piece and having this great time and told me about how a man had a boyfriend, no, a guy had come to the home to a, when she was in the hospital and witnessed to her and she found this church and all this. And I said, oh dear, you know, but we spent time with her and she had a book more than a carpenter. I think it was Josh McDowell's book. Mm -hmm. And I read it while I was there. And I spent about a, almost a week just helping her out, going, you know, because she had her hands full. I did some grocery shopping for her. We talked and stuff. And when I left, I had this horrible sense of depression. Like, yeah, I, I, I miss her. And then I started thinking about it. And I said, I do miss her, but I really miss who she is or what she's got, you know? And I said, I stopped at one place over looking at a cliff on the ocean. And I said, Lord, you know, I don't know what's going on, but if, if you're real and you got something going on, let me know. <laughs> and on my way through Washington State, I had this classic Damascus Road experience. I mean, I was driving my car, and suddenly I wasn't driving my car. I was standing in the middle of this incredibly bright light, and I don't know how long it was. And I sure hope someone was driving the car because it was just this incredible sense of of i don't know peace bliss whatever you want to call it and but the sense of this is jesus how do you know that i don't know but this is jesus and when i came when i kind of came to two i stopped my car and it was i ran around the car jumping and screaming and laughing and just had this and i said what's this all about and from that point forward 
I got to my next friend's house next, uh, that day, and I said, hey, hi, how nice to see you, Scott. By the way, do you got a Bible here anywhere? <laughs> and I started to just dive into the Bible. And I came back to work, and I said, you know, I, I, I think I want to quit work because I've, I've been here six years, and I think I want to try something else, and I'm going to go live in Steamboat. My boss, bless his heart, he said, you know, the work's slow here now. I'm going to give you a six month leave of absence and let you think about that. I said, thank you. Wow. I said, so I went up and I joined a church, church up in Steamboat. Actually, I went to a church here for a while, the Efe Church with uh, Pastor Grimm was running the church at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then I went up to um, Steamboat and uh, a small little Assembly of God church. It almost looked like a prefab building. Weldon McMath was a the pastor there. And uh, I like a lot of the pastors I've worked with. He won my heart. He was such a down to earth, nice guy. I went into his uh, chapel one day. I, I would ski all week, but during Monday, I'd, I'd swing over there, and he was, you know, he was a chief cook and bottle washer, vacuuming the carpets and stuff. And he said, "How you doing?" I said, "I don't know." I said, I, "I'm just trying to figure out is, is this stuff for real?" And he didn't even blink. You know, he swam. He said, "Well, why don't you ask the question? Why you're even here asking the question?" And I thought about it. I went, "Thank you," and. I walked out and that anchored me, you know, for quite a while. Um, came back here, uh, plugged into the first Christian church. Um, and while I was here, previous, I had a girlfriend for a while back and she left and she and her sister's family were involved in the Way International. And and I saw a person driving by when they had the bumper sticker on and I, I came alongside him. I said, hey, where do you guys meet and stuff? I heard about you. And for about six months, I got wrapped up in the Way International. And that's really important because that formed a lot of my thinking in the sense of what not to do. You know, um, I read their books voraciously and I bought into it. And, but they were like kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, if you're really serious about following God, just don't mess with anyone else. Stay with us, you know, kind of isolating you. And they showed me how if you got extra literal, ex, uh, super literal, super, um, that's the word I'm thinking of, you know, the Bible says what it says and means what it says and, you know, straightforward. They could show you how there were five, three, four people crucified with Christ. Of course, they believe Christ was the son of God, not God, uh, kind of a Jehovah's Witnesses approach and all that stuff. And I'm too social of a guy. I didn't like being cut off for people. And even though I liked what I was reading it and they had me convinced I kind of thought, I got to get out of here. And I did. And I met Mike Miller, had a church here, Living Word Outreach. Mm. And I went there. And although a lot of people would call that extreme, that was pretty, that was pretty tame compared to what I came out of. Mm. And I got a lot of healing there. And then I plugged into the vineyard. And that's where I really landed on my feet. Mm. And kind of had to, you know, deconstruction is, is a painful process when you're leaving something you really found a lot of joy in and then you realize maybe it wasn't true. And so that was my first, that was my first um, process of deconstructing and reconstructing my faith. Um, Vineyard did a good thing for me. In this time period, when I was alone, I met my wife, Carolyn, um, good lady, older than I was. We got, uh, she had just adopted a, uh, a Korean child as a single mother and that attracted me. We got married and we raised horses out north of town. She was a graduate student at MIT and about six years older than I was. And I could see there was a lot of differences here, but I said, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll work them out. <laughs> Adopted two more children from Korea as older children. Um, and that, that was quite an experience for me. I, I went from thinking, aren't I doing something noble? And I'm going to create some college graduates here to like, God, I hope to get out of high school, to like, God, I hope to get out of jail, and to like, God, I'm really sorry, because I was my ego that was driving this adoption as much as my affection for the kids, and I, that humbled me a great deal, and I discovered how much I loved them, and that they would land on their feet. Now, that was the boys. My daughter, Melody, took the high road. She went to the vineyard with me. She got baptized. I helped baptize her. She met a boy from another church, and she got married, and they live over in Windsor right now. But when the smoke cleared, um, my marriage dissolved. Um, the two boys were still wrestling with, you know, uh, issues with law. And uh, a friend of mine who I was walking with, who was also had been divorced a long time before, 
we just all of a sudden um, found out we were each other's um, role models and best friend. And, and so we got married and that's, that's Ellen. And uh, she was real good for me. Um, and, and as during that time, both boys who had gotten in trouble and had gotten into jail and, had, you know, they kind of had this baton they passed between them, between whose turn it was to, you know, go out and, you know, and violate probation or whatever. Uh, they ended up coming through our house and uh, my wife moved to uh, Arizona. She kept in contact with them, of course, but we were the ones kind of giving a place to be, the place where they had the ankle monitors on and went to jail, we visited them. And, and it was a long, it was a marathon race. Both of them landed on their feet and both of them ended up doing okay. Uh, and I was real proud of them because to succeed once you've been on probation and once you've been you know, declared a felon is to succeed with weights tied around your ankles. Um, you don't, uh, it, if it was hard before and you couldn't clear the bar, now they raised the bar, put weights on your ankles, said jump over it now, and they did. Uh, and during this time, uh, I was really at home in, in the vineyard and my, and my faith and Ellen was too with me. Uh, we went with Mike Pike when he had a separate, separate small church for a while. And then Mike, uh, they, Mike kind of dissolved the church and we uh, went back to the vineyard and they were more of a <laughs> videotaping church now with dark, I, Ellen hates dark rooms, I do too. So we looked around a bit and, and really found myself surprisingly at home at the First Presbyterian Church with Rich McDermott. Uh, I hadn't seen the Presbyterian Church quite that evangelical before. And, uh, and there's some roots, it was a nice thing. All these roots of mine kind of came to surface, all this evangelical, all came together and I really enjoyed that church. I went with them to, uh, I went to the Dominican Republic with their little outreach they did on a mission trip. Um, but then that church kind of imploded, and I'm sure Bob could tell you more of it than I could. But, uh, and so we turned around, a lot of people we knew were gone. And we started looking around again, and I came over to uh, uh, Everyday Joe's because it was up the street, and I heard, heard Darren speak a couple times at some of the noon services they had hosted at the Presbyterian Church. And we just said, well, let's temporarily stop here. It looked like a college church. We were older. We didn't think we'd plug in that much. And to our surprise, we weren't the oldest, and we met some people who I'd seen years before at the vineyard. And over time, we found out, and having small groups and stuff, we found out there's a lot of people there who were close to and we care about. Uh, Pastor Darren, he's, he's, he's going through his own kind of, uh, of um, change, and, and I won't call it deconstruction. That would be unfair to him. But he, he's, he's, he's speaking to something inside of me that's, that, that's been kind of struggling for a long time. That's kind of taking all these different pieces of the different churches I've been with as I try to figure out who's this Jesus I actually saw before I even opened a Bible. And what's the Bible say about him now? And how do I understand that? Because um, my, my faith was kind of being rocked to and fro through the last four, five years of political turbulence and stuff like that. Um, and so I've come to some conclusions that my certainty, you, there's no place, you start, starting in the way international certainty is huge. <laughs> As you leave it, I found out my certainty isn't critical to me. Uh, and it doesn't upset me that much. It would, it would have upset me before. Actually, that I had to come to a core issue. God's real. God, Jesus is real. Jesus is an expression of God's love to me, which is, you know, gave himself for me before I even cared. Um, and everything else there helps explain that to me. And if I get something wrong, it's not going to be on my, I've said this before, my divine SAT test when I walk up to the gates of heaven. Um, but in the middle of all this, just a few experiences of for me, having to deal with my two boys and watching them struggle. Um, I had one older brother who had was a pharmacist, he was in the Navy, he got out, he was six and a half years older than I am. And then he, he succumbed to schizophrenia, seriously. And I ended up doing things like going to Sacramento and going in the streets of, this, of the, the equivalent of a Bowery district to find him, convince him to come home, meaning to my parents' place. Since he was, and he finally got diagnosed and since that 
kind of came out of him while he was in the Navy. He got VA benefits and he settled into a VA hospital, a uh, mental hospital up in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And I would go visit him. And my mom would visit him. He had sort of a real, dad was the focus of his anger. My dad was never the focus of my anger. I love my dad, but whatever. And uh, over time, that softened in him. And eventually he ended up his last three years in a VA home, kind of like a rest home in Laverne, Minnesota, which had a reputation for veterans. But uh, in that process, my brother got into very, very dark things. And Anton LaVey and satanic stuff, he thought that was, he discovered the truth. And he would essentially send things like tracks out to his friends on how wonderful this was. And that pretty much cut him off from the rest of the people who wanted to deal with them, except for a very close friend of his. So Ellen and I and my mom were visiting him. We usually went at Easter and he was grumbling and talking about how the world is a selfish place and everyone really self-centered, even if they're doing good. And I looked at him, I said, Dick, when you're on the street, people like the Salvation Army, those people are the people that saved your butt. And those are the people who were serving Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to leave and I'll see you in here. Can I pray for you? And Ellen and I put our hands on him. He said, okay, we prayed for him. I left. We got back a year later. All that stuff was gone. All that he had really tied into a, a neat priest at the uh, VA hospital. That enlightened him. So then in short, he, he, I'll say he became a Christian. I use that word softly now. I used to be, have a defined point for that. He arrived at Christianity, at Jesus. And that didn't clear his head up for being sane, but he made him kind. What changed in him, he became a very kind man. Still, a lot of times, nutty and fruitcake, but not, but no darkness in him. And, and that was an interesting transition for me. So I, I won't say I've seen it all, but I've seen enough. Um, divorce, and jail, and restitution, and mental illness. And it's just kind of, uh, mm, it's kept my heart soft for people to struggle. And, uh, and this group uh, has just sort of, whether you guys knew it or not, I've been in the middle of this of my life for 35 years. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, been a good, it's been a good place for me to anchor myself. And um, that's the short of my story. Wow. Amazing. Any questions? <laughs> well, I think we can all, of course, relate to, to pieces, pieces of it. And of course, I, you know, my ears really perked up when you use that term deconstruction. Um, I think we've been talking, well, I know we have been talking about it here. And I think we can all relate to it. We don't know the details of, of your pain and and just with you it was just years and years and years of you know with with family stuff. But we all know that I think everybody on this call knows that that term and what that what that means. It doesn't scare me anymore. No. Um yeah, they did mention I worked for the city for 42 years. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> yeah, oh, that, yeah. I, 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 had a, I, I did go back to graduate school for a while, right after I found Christ, and I kept my employment. As I said I was leaving with absence. I came back and worked part-time while I got my degree in forest management. It was a master's degree. And when I graduated, um, the... At that time, Ronald Reagan became president. I voted for the guy, but he put on a federal freeze on hiring. So that was about the time I was supposed to be assigned, you know, basically a national forest to be a planner for it. And um, I just had married my first wife and she had horses and all this stuff. So they were only hiring people on a temporary basis. And I didn't want to haul horses and everything around the country. And the, my boss at work said that they would be falling under some federal regulations. He said, can you come back and help us work with that? And I said, absolutely. And so I came back in an enhanced status with you know, some more skill tools to play with. And I, after that, I got involved in rates and cost of service studies from that till the day I retired. And uh, I think I've created some of the most aggressive rates back then with the city, especially in commercial customers in the country. We used to go to seminars and talk about it. So I was very proud of that. Yeah, um, and reason to, reason to be. Yeah, it was, the, yeah. Yeah. It was to our commercial. So that was my <clears throat> secular accomplishment. <laughs> Yeah, and Four Collins Light and Powers, I mean, the whole, 
you know, the, the whole utility is, has always been very innovative. And, um, you know, the utility rates, the, the consistency of the service, and you guys are in the, like the top one, one tenth of one percent, aren't you? We, we have been, I'm not going to, it's, it's, it's changing. The, uh, the old guard that set this, uh, laid the foundation and they laid a really good foundation are gone. And they're right now in the middle of doing it. And this is, <laughs> this is, you know, you know, they're doing all that Wi-Fi installation for the connections there. And, and that remains to be seen how successful that will be. That's in transition. But if it isn't successful, it's underwritten by the uh, uh, latent power bonds and funds. So, you'll see your rates go up if it doesn't work out if it does work out you'll see everything be ducky so uh, <laughs> keep watching that one <laughs> so that that's how we can tell huh we just yeah that's how you can tell <laughs> <laughs> i still keep in touch with the people over there you know so yeah, yeah. it's that was a nutshell i skipped uh, some of those things could have some fun depth in them but i as you're talking i said oh, these are the important points for you kind of know who i am and uh, and what my um, tenderness is towards what what, what things I kind of understand in some people, yeah. Yeah. We, what we, what year was your uh, exposure to the Way International? What when was it? That? Was pretty soon after. Well, I, I had my epiphany um, in 1977, and then 78. I, I my then that. Fall winter, my, my winter steamboat was 77 to 78, and you know, the churches. And then I came back and I encountered the way for about my first six months of graduate school uh, on the side. I was going to that, and I had to handle that turbulence. And by the way, that was that was painful. I mean, that, uh, leaving what I thought I, when I read those books, I said, Holy crap, this is really great stuff! I found that there's all this wonderful stuff, and I just poured over it. And then, and then after I left them, I, I left them without yet kind of writing off what I thought I'd learned. And then thanks to a, some very tender teaching and stuff like that, I said, oh yeah, this, this doesn't make sense. And yeah, this, this, this doesn't really fit. And what it did was it taught me that if you get too hyper literate, too, um, what's the word when it's a plain spoken word they talk about that, you know, I believe the Bible is authoritative. I believe it's an error I believe it's, and there's a word they use for it saying the plain thing you can teach a farmer it you know but anyway i found out that's abused a lot and you sometimes do need to dive into the weeds do need to look at context do need to have some people with some trained uh it was overly scholars. simplistic for sure I mean, simplistic, their, their, yeah. their big thing is it, it means what it says it says what it means you Bingo. know but but it's um you know, if you get a different version or a different translation, then it doesn't mean what it says. No, and, and no one that you're no one there with any expertise is allowed him to ask a few hard questions, which would kind of begin the deconstruction of it. Yeah, it's it's very simplistic, very. Uh, but it you know it had a very large. I was one of them. Had a very large following for a while. It was huge, and and that small group I joined meeting with them. Yeah. It, it, you know, you, I, I tried to take what I learned that was good and discard what I didn't. And and what I've really become sensitive to is when you run into people who have been involved in cults and they come out of or even certain extreme lifestyles, be tender and sensitive to them. Don't beat them up. You know, um, they've they've been through a hard time. <laughs> yeah, Compassion is a really helpful tool. There's no downside to being kind. <laughs> no, 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 thank. You. And and yeah, there's a little, a little. So true. Uh, there's a little. I've I've been turned on to a little meditation app called Lectio 365. I use in the morning, and then they go to that center of the core. It says, "Let's start off with understanding the kindness of God." God, and yeah, there's no downside to that. You know, that that's a good place to anchor yourself. Yeah. Well, Bill, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, very much. And, and you're uh, welcome. I really enjoy, I think we all really enjoyed it and can certainly, certainly relate to a lot of bits and pieces. You, you and Vince talking about the way, you know, I just think as younger men, we were, many of us were captured with some aspect of Christianity because it, we were at a stage where we were all at a point where we wanted to hook into something meaningful. You Bingo. know, we were looking for what what is life all about and, and um, purposeful? 
and um, you know, it really makes us in a, um, you know, we're vul- we're young and we're vulnerable, and, and we're and called believers. We, we believe yeah. a lot of stuff on our way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we all we probably all have bits and pieces of that story that we can, you know, how, how we were knuckleheads when, <laughs> when we were younger. So. Well, wow. Well, okay, um, Bill. Thank you, and um, we're gonna we're going to shut this this portion of it now, and this will be posted on our website. Christ in the Rockies is the Bill Schweitzer story. And before I say goodbye, I say good morning to Dick Schilling. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. We're we're just good. wrapping up Bill's story, and so um, we'll uh, thank you, Bill. You're welcome.